Amen. Well, you can say hi to someone around you. Let them know you're glad that they're here and you can be seated. You can be seated. Welcome to Palm Sunday. Where's our palm branches at? Somebody forgot the palm branches. Anybody grow up in a church where you got palm branches? And uh, man, we need some palm branches. Waving them around in church. That would be great. So everybody doing good? You doing all right? Did you get your pictures taken? No, you didn't get your pictures taken? Did you get, did anybody get, do you like it? Is it cool? Is it worth doing? If you don't like it, we won't do it again. It's fine. You, I'm not doing it for me. We're doing it for you. Anybody, so did you get your pictures taken? Let me see. You like it? Is it good? You know, that idea came from that, the old school phone directories. Anybody remember the old school church phone directories? And we were trying to think, how can we invest in families? How can we create a memory, help families create a memory together with one another? You know, we know that in the world we live in, the enemy's attacking homes. He's attacking families, uh, ripping them to shreds, just ripping families apart. And, you know, there's just something about being in the house of God together, being with your family in the presence of God that's so important. And to capture that moment, to capture that memory um, to hopefully put it somewhere where you can just be reminded that no matter what the enemy's doing, that there's uh, God's people praying for you, standing with you, and uh, most importantly, God uh, is with you, standing with you, believing with you for your family to be preserved and stay together. And so think about that memory that you're creating today, but also think about how many families don't have a church. Think about how many families you know, have no place to come and to be encouraged and lifted or have community or have help. And families all over the place, families you know right now that are hurting. And so one of the ways you can use that picture, there's no pressure to do this, but one of the ways you can use that picture is just say, hey, from our family to yours, we know how tough life is. We know how tough family is. And from our family to yours, if you don't have a place to go for Easter, share that picture on Facebook and let them know uh, that Seven Hills would love to have them and you can come. Uh, with you and your family, or they can come with you and your family. So we're excited about Easter. Anybody ready for Easter? Uh, ready for Resurrection Weekend? You got your Bibles from there, Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, verse 37. This is right after Jesus has entered Jerusalem. The triumphant entry is what it's called. It says, as he now was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees or religious critics, I mean, you know, that's been around since the time of Jesus, called to Jesus from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as Jesus drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. That's just a really powerful thing to think about, that Jesus, in the midst of all this celebration, is weeping. And the Bible says the reason he's weeping is because the people missed his hour of visitation. We know that as we begin this Palm Weekend or Palm Sunday, we're entering into what's called Holy Week or the seven days that's changed the world. Inside of these seven days that we're entering into is where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Inside of these seven days is where Jesus went to Gethsemane and prayed with such intensity that his sweat became drops of blood. Inside of this week was Jesus' betrayal Inside of this week was Jesus' arrest, his, his false accusations that were brought against him. He was convicted and sentenced to death by crucifixion on a cross. He would die on that bloody cross. They would put him in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And on the third day, he would be raised to life again. All of that happens inside of the week that we're about to enter into. This is a powerful week in history. This week displays to us the heart of God for the world and in 
and most importantly for humanity as well. And so the scene that we read about here or right before we went into those passages is the scene where Jesus is riding in on the donkey. We've all heard the story. And they're putting their garments on the path, which was a Middle Eastern custom. Anybody that was held in high esteem or high honor, you would place your garments or palm branches on the path that they would come down. And so all of this is happening. They're shouting Hosanna. They're shouting uh, victory. They're shouting salvation. And in the midst of all of this rejoicing, Jesus is weeping. So if you look past the palm branches, if you look past their shouts, if you look past all of the victory parade type things going on, Jesus is found weeping. While everyone else is celebrating, Jesus is weeping. Have you ever been there before? Everyone else is celebrating, but you're weeping. I mean, maybe people don't know about it. I mean, we do a pretty good job at putting on, you know, our, our masks and different things. But everybody else is celebrating, but something's just not right in your life. Everyone else is blessed and you're stressed. Everyone else, it seems like they've got friends and people they can count on and you just keep being let down over and over and over and you find yourself isolated and alone. Everybody else are back there taking the pictures of their perfect little family and you're thinking to yourself, we about killed each other on the way here. She about gouged my eyes out with those new fingernails that had just been done up that I paid for and she used them. Is that just Sarah and me? I'm sorry, I'm working it out. I'm working it out. So everyone else is rejoicing, but Jesus is weeping. Tears are a result physically of the glands in our eyes. And what happens is whenever you're motivated by the intensity of emotion, the physical manifestation of that emotion is tears. So you're living your life, you're doing whatever you do. It could happen anywhere at any time. It can happen in a car, it can happen in a church service, it can happen in a conversation, it can happen listening to a song, it can happen anywhere. Intense emotion hits you and then the uncontrollable happens. The uncontrollable happens and your glands begin to release tears and as the tears stream down your face. That is, that is the physical manifestation. It's not the tears as much as it's what's going on inside that creates those tears. This is a worldwide phenomenon. This is an international experience. You go anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter what creed, an intense emotional experience hits a human being and the result is tears begin to flow. And when we weep and when we cry because of that intense emotion behind it, there's something powerful about every tear. Most of God's greats find themselves shedding tears. The Bible says that Joseph wept, Hannah wept, Nehemiah wept, Ezra wept. Je Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. It says that his head was a fountain of tears. Peter would weep, John would weep, Paul would weep, Mary would weep, and of course we read it, Jesus would also weep. There's something about tears that the scripture wants us to know about. Specifically on this day, I think that there's something about Palm Weekend as we enter into all that God's doing for us that we have to begin to frame why is it that I've had moments in my life of intense emotion where it's not the tears as much as that intense emo emotion uh, is, has formed me, has, has in many ways branded me. It's like that, I, I can go back in my life to moments where intense emotion hits and it's, it's so easy to return back to those moments because of that powerful emotional experience. And so what's the Bible saying here? We know that David was a man of war which to me would speak of someone that's hardened because of the blood and the guts and the horrific things that he 
would have seen. I mean, if anybody should have been able to be so hardened that they no longer experience tears, it would be David. But as David is running from Saul, cave to cave, he's finding himself hiding. He hears that Saul has died, and the Bible says that David wept. Not only did David weep, but the Bible says when he wept, he was on Mount Gilboa. And on that mountain, as tears are streaming down his face and splashing on the grassy hillside, David begins to speak. And David begins to speak specifically to that place where those tears were flowing. And he says, on this mountain, right here in this grassy, plush, flourishing hillside, right here, never again will anything grow, never again will rain descend, or never again will do be on Mount Gilboa. And that place that was flourishing and prospering, that was filled with flowers and grass and, and, and really all around it. There's no reason for that area to ever dry up. To this day, you can go to the Holy Land and right there where Mount Gilboa is, there's a place and it's nothing but sand and it's believed to be the place that David spoke to that mountain during that intense emotional experience. The lesson is this. As we look at the people in Scripture that found themselves weeping, you find the ones that truly begin to find a way through the tears to overcome the tears. They didn't just weep. They also talked to their tears. They would speak to the place that was devastating to them. They would, they would talk to it. You're not going to forever have life. You're not going to forever have such a presence in my, I'm not going to always let this moment de define the rest of my life. And they would, they would talk to those tears. It's interesting that it appears that heaven listens intently during our tears. As Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, the Bible says Jesus would weep. Everyone's saying it's final, it's over, there's no hope, there's no chance, there's no life. But but we find that Jesus is not only weeping, Jesus also begins to talk to his tears. And he begins to say, no, this isn't final. And he looks and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And because he was willing to speak and talk to his tears, Lazarus went from a place of death to life. A lot of people never learn how to talk to their tears. All across this auditorium today, there's a lonely single, there's lonely single mothers. They're trying to figure out, how am I going to make ends meet? There's people that are going through a crisis that they're not sure they're ever going to find their way out of. There are those who have just lost their job and they're anxious and worried how they're going to provide for their families. There are those who are facing excruciating loss and unfortunate circumstances and they're dealing with the pain of that loss. Those who are facing personal failure over and over, beating themselves up, just can't believe that, that they just keep making that stupid mistakes, thinking, what an idiot, how can I do that? How could I put myself in that situation? Others going through divorces and relationship breaks up. And the thing about those tears is they represent sincerity. And so that sincerity that they represent is important to God. The Bible says the goal of our command is love, purity, and sincerity of heart. So there's something about sincerity that God says, I'm going to take note. I'm going to, I'm going to be watching. I'm paying attention. The scripture says that God actually keeps every tear in a bottle. So there's something about our tears that matter to God. He's looking at the tears, but more important than looking at the tears, he's looking at us and he wants to see what we're going to say and are we going to talk to our tears. See, most people just allow their tears to do the talking. Something happens to them, the intense emotion hits, the physical manifestation is, tears begin to flow and all of a sudden they begin to be convinced They'll never love again. They'll never have hope again. They'll never have joy again. They'll, 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 they'll never laugh again. They'll never have peace again. They'll, they, they, they'll always be miserable, always be down, always be depressed because tears are incredibly persuasive. 
And they have a way of just being so convincing that they talk you into this situation, whatever it is, however painful it is, now this is going to be the rest of your life. It's never going to change. This happened, that happened, they did this, they did that, this went down, that went down. Now, as a result, life is never going to be the same and those tears have a way of just convincing you you're always going to be down. But at some point you learn that things don't change until you talk to your tears. The way Sarah and I do it is like this. The girls occasionally will think that they have more of a place in our home than what they do. (laughs) And we don't like what they're saying or what they're thinking. And they're trying to talk and they can even get very emotional with us about how we're wrong and how we shouldn't and how dare we. And, and, and Sarah and I have this way where we just say, you hear anything, babe? <laughs> she says, no, nope, I'm like, me either. So how was your day? It was great. And they're, ah. And we're like, we elevate above what they're saying. Tears are the same way. Tears are so loud. They're so convincing. They, they're, they're so passionate. They, they throw temper tantrums. No, they, they're, just, they, they're just so convincing. They're so fatal in their conversation. And you have to have the ability to just like Sarah and I did, say, God, do you hear anything? God's like, nope. In other words, you've got to be able to have a conversation with God. David did this. He goes to Ziglag, and the Bible says that that they show up, their homes have been burned, their children have been kidnapped, their wives have been kidnapped, and it was such an emotional experience that David wept, his men wept, and the Bible says they wept with such intensity that they had no more power to weep. They had wept so much that they couldn't even find a way to create another tear. And in this moment, the Bible says that David's men start looking at David and they start saying, we're in this position because of him. This is his fault. We've lost our homes, we've lost our wives, we've lost our children, and this is David's fault. And one man's tears start talking to another man's tears and another man's tears start talking to another man's tears and they start convincing each other that they're the victim of David. And that the only way things are going to change is if they get rid of David. And so they decide we're going to kill David. We're going to take David out. Because tears always put the blame on someone else. They blame people. They blame God. They blame all. Tear, and again, they're real. They matter. They're important. It's not that God dismisses our tears. It's that we have to be careful. Because tears have a tendency to put all the power in someone else's hand. And some, what someone else has done, what someone else has said, or what someone else hasn't done or hasn't said. But David, instead of trying to get his people over here and talk to their pain and them, their pain talk to him and him try to build up a group against that group, David, the Bible says, encourages himself in the Lord. He strengthens himself in the Lord. And watch what happens him and God start having a conversation above that conversation. David doesn't retaliate. David doesn't blame. David doesn't come up with excuses. David doesn't say, David, David says, God, I don't, know what's gonna, I don't know why this has happened. I don't know what to do. And David starts having a conversation with God. And you know what? God and David start talking back and forth. And just like Sarah and I, it's literally like, The emotions of the situation are silenced. And God tells David, he doesn't give him an answer, he doesn't give him an explanation, but he says, if you'll get up, you can recover it all. There's something about learning that when you cry, your problems are bracing themselves, hoping that you don't understand the importance of that moment and the importance of not allowing your tears to do all the talking, 
but you to do some talking as well. They braced themselves. Mountains braced themselves. The most horrific of problems braced themselves because, because most people never learn how to talk to their tears. Their tears do all the talking. Their tears shut them up. Their tears silence them. And their tears and that pain beat them down over and over and over. And some people for years of their life lose who they are all over an intense emotional experience. And they never learn to say, okay, okay, okay. You've had your turn. You've had your talk. I feel you. I get you. I understand. It hurts. It's bad. But me and God are going to now have a conversation and we're going to ignore you for a minute and we're going to figure out how to get a plan to get out of this and not stay in this. You see, there's something that hell learns about a person that when it can hit someone with that intense emotion and they can just keep on going. There's something about somebody with tears that keeps on moving that hell knows nothing can stop them. You see, because of tears, many people are pulled away from God. When the goal is our tears are to pull us towards God. What shall we do with our tears? Talk to them. I'm not talking about crying over spilt milk. I'm saying the lesson is when you have great tasks to be completed, you have a family that needs to be raised. You have the demands of the job, the demands of life, the pressures of relationships, the pressures of marriage. When your days are filled with tears, you talk to them. You make a decision to talk to your tears. Because if you just let them do all the talking, they're going to convince you to quit and give up. Jesus is found weeping on Palm Weekend 2,000 years ago. But his tears don't stop him. His tears motivate him. And he finds himself to the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, again, he finds himself weeping. But he doesn't stop. He could have stopped. The Bible is clear that he's negotiating in that time whether or not he really wants to continue going forward. But he pushes through the tears. He goes to the cross. He's hanging on the cross, and the Bible says there's tears flowing on the cross. Again, the challenge is he can stop, but he chooses to not just let his tears do the talking. He chooses to allow his tears to motivate him, and we find out that no matter how devastating things were in his life, he allowed his tears to not have the final say. I'm closing with this story. New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech was playing the University of California in the Rose Bowl. Roy Regals was somehow confused after he had received a fumble and returned it 65 years in the wrong, or 65 yards, excuse me, I can't read my writing, 65 yards in the wrong direction until he was tackled by one of his own teammates. At halftime, as we know, the coach usually has a lot to say, but this time, the locker room was silent. Roy found himself in a corner, the towel draped over his face, he cried like a baby. Everyone was waiting, what's Coach Price going to do for the second half? Nothing was said during the entire halftime until they got ready to go back out and play and Coach Price just said one thing, he said the same team that started the first half will be the same team that starts the second half. Every one of the players left that locker room but Roy. He sat there sobbing, and Coach Price said, Roy, let's go. We've got a game to play. I said, the same guys that started the first half are going to start the second half. And Roy looked up with tears streaming down his face and said, I cannot do it. I can't do it. I, I can't. I, there's no way I can go back out there. I've ruined you, I've ruined the university, my team, myself. There's no way I can go back out on those, that field and face that crowd. There's no way I could ever go back out there again. And Coach Price put his hand on Roy's shoulder and said, the game is only half over, Roy. And he went back out there with those tears streaming down his face. And the tech men say to this day, They've never seen a man play football as Roy Regals played that second half. And that's the way it is for many of you. 
Your tears have convinced you, I can't get back out there. I can't go at it again. I can't, I can't give again. I can't open up again. I can't, I can't. But the truth is, it's not as fatal as you think. At some point, with tears streaming down your face, you got to make a decision. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to say there's some game left to play. There's some life yet to live. There's some dreams yet to capture but you have to make a decision to talk to your tears. You know, Psalms 126 actually teach us that your tears are a seed. Isn't that amazing? It says your tears are a seed. I don't know a ton about seeds, but when you're a preacher, you have to know a little bit about it. It's all throughout the Bible. So what I do know is that a seed isn't much until it's put in the soil. Am I right about it? And when the seed goes in the soil, even though we know it germinates and all that, it's really a phenomenon that at some point, we don't really know how, the Bible actually says by itself, it just springs up. And that when you and I cry, there is purpose in every single tear. There's purpose in it. But most people don't know how to take that seed and sow it into the soil of God's promise because they need an explanation. That's what we do, right? Why? Why me? Why this? Why now? Why? But you can't ever see that seed flourish if you sow it in the soil of an explanation. Because explanations change all the time. Faith doesn't require answers. Faith says, I know your promises are true even though I don't have an answer to why this happened. I don't get it, I don't know, I don't have an answer. But what I do know is his promises are sure. What I do know is that the Bible says his word will not return back void, but it will accomplish what it's sent out to do. What I do know is that even though I can't see it, and maybe I won't see it in 50 years, maybe we won't see it in 80 years, but at some point, the cycle of what God does, it might be a thousand years, but somehow God takes every single tear if we'll plant them in the soil of his purpose, and somehow or another, we don't know how. There's gonna be some cold seasons maybe, some cold winters, right, after the seed's planted, but at some point, God has a way of cycling those things back around for our good and for our family's good. You have to sow the tear. That's why the Bible says that mourning happens during the night, but joy comes in the morning. But a lot of people never learn, I'm going to take this tear, I'm going to sow it. God, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I'm going to sow it. And I'm going to trust you, and I'm I'm going to put this seed of my pain, I'm going to put it in your purposes and your plan, and I'm going to trust your promises. And somehow or another, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for that spring moment to come. That's why I'm wearing this shirt right now, right, because it's springtime. Sun's out, 75 degrees right now, and the grass is coming up everywhere. The flowers are beginning to bloom everywhere. Same thing happens when we take those tears and we plant them. At some point, spring comes. At some point, life comes. At some point, we look back and we say, man, I couldn't stand that pain. I thought it was gonna get the best of me, but I rose above it and I talked to it. I said, no, I'm gonna put you in the soil of God's promise, and I'm gonna trust him. And I'm going to move forward and I'm going to push forward and I'm not going to back up and I'm not going to back down. Did you know that the phrase Hosanna was never meant to be celebrative? The phrase Hosanna was a cry. It was a cry saying, God, here we are. We're trapped. We're in bondage. We're under the rule of of a foreign enemy. And Hosanna was meant to be a cry for help. Hosanna is a cry, it's a, it's a cry of desperation. And it's a, before the etymology of the word, and now we celebrate, oh, Hosanna, I do it too, we do it too. But originally, it wasn't 
Hosanna. Originally it was Hosanna. I need you, God. I need you. We need you to save us. We need you to give us victory. We don't know what to do. We're in such pain. We're in such bondage. We're, we're trapped. We're all around. Our enemies are surrounded. We don't know what to do. But we know that, that in you there's victory. And so they cried out. They beseeched. They were desperate. God, give us victory in this situation. Most people never learn how to talk to their tears. They just go silent. Their tears convince them it's never going to change. So what I want us to do on Palm Weekend is I don't know what your situation is. Maybe in your life everything's great. We're happy for you. But for many people in this room, there's things that have devastated them. I can think of families right now in my mind that have been devastated by some kind of loss. And what the enemy's so good at doing, he's so good. He's so good at using that against us. And so we've got the word of God. We've got the example of Jesus on Palm Weekend to say, no, nope, we're not gonna be like those people where we're defined by our tears. We're gonna be the people that talk to our tears. We're gonna be the people that say, no, we're gonna rise up no matter how sad it's been, how, no matter how broken I am, no matter how devastated I am, no matter how mad I am, no matter how angry I am, no matter how upset I am, I'm not gonna live my life in bitterness and unforgiveness and anger and resentment, nope. I'm gonna talk to my tears instead. I'm gonna have another conversation. I'm gonna elevate my conversation and I'm gonna say, God, Hosanna, I need your help. I need you and my family. I need you with my kids. I need you with my sons and my daughters. We need